Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, listeners. Welcome to Achieve Wealth Podcast. This is James Kandasamy. Achieve Wealth Podcast focuses on commercial real estate operators who is uh, killing it in the uh, all kind of uh, commercial real estate asset classes. Today, I have Kyle Mitchell. Uh, Kyle is from California who has bought uh, his first deal of 42 units in in the market of uh, Tucson, Arizona. And uh, he's going to be sharing his experience on coming to that first deal. And uh, Kyle's also a co-host of his uh, weekly real estate podcast, which is Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate. Hey, Kyle, welcome to the show. Hey, James, how are you doing? Uh, I'm happy to be on and, and thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to to see someone, uh, you know, starting to buy in this market, right? In this red hot market right now where it's so competitive, even though it's still the best time to buy just because of the the uh, the climate of uh, buying the deals, right? The, the interest rate is really good and uh, and there's a lot of capital looking for place to park, uh, park their money and make money as well. And But the biggest problem is finding the right deal. So, so tell me about your journey. Uh, I mean, when did you start looking for deal? I mean, when did you start even thinking about investing in real estate? Yeah, so I've been investing in real estate since 2013. And how I got started was um, even in high school, I invested a little bit of money in the stock market. I had a, had a couple thousand dollars invested in the stock market and I lost it in six months. And it was you know nothing that I could do about it. And uh, I just learned quickly that I wanted more control over my investments. And I just started looking online and, and listening to some podcasts, reading some books, like most people, Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, was one of the books that changed my life. And I just knew I wanted to get into real estate. So I bought my first single family home in uh, Long Beach, California, Southern California, and uh, started building up a small portfolio of single family homes across the United States. And from there, I learned quickly that I couldn't scale as fast as I wanted to with single family homes. And I wanted real estate to be my vehicle to provide myself and my family with financial freedom. And so I started looking at some other asset classes. And that's when I found multifamily. I got it. Got it. Got it. You, you, just, you just reminded me of something very interesting in my, uh, my life when I go into real estate. I mean, I read the first time, for the first time, I, was, I read the Robert Kiyosaki's book maybe like uh, what 10 15 years ago when i was busy working and i can never understand the book i know it changed a lot of people's life uh, when they read it i mean i recently read it again and and now it all makes sense in the beginning it didn't make sense i i say what is this guy talking about because we are so busy on a w2 job and especially me and i can never understand and um or what is it trying to talk about so what was the aha moment when you read that book i mean what is that yeah, to, to be honest, I did read that book and I reread it several times. The one that really changed my uh, thinking was his Cash Flow Quadrant book, um, okay. if I'm being honest. So, but he really teaches you how to be, how to understand how, you know, working, how your time works for you, basically. And so being a business owner and a um, entrepreneur, you can have other people working for you while you make money. Otherwise, you're trading your time for money, being a independent contractor or a self, you know, a small business owner or a W two employee. And so that was the biggest mindset shift to me is really, you know, purchasing assets, not liabilities, that cash flow while you sleep, and having other people work on them for you. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, it may be people who are in W two job who have read his book and never get it, and I was one of them, right? Uh, because I think when you're working, you know, nine to five. Uh, you know, W2 job, you're busy. And suddenly when you get this knowledge about, hey, you know, you can do business, you can do investment, you know, it's like, you know, completely out of your arena, right? And I, I just, I read a few pages and I gave up on it because I, I, it just doesn't align to me. So for the people who are using, who are in W2 job, uh, just be aware, you know, sometimes uh, it may not align with you because you're busy working in your own job. But 
I think, uh, you know, when you mingle with people in real estate or with the business people, you get, you, 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 you get it, right? Uh, but if you are just working in, in, uh, in your W2 job, you may not get it, right? So just to be aware, you have to change your network to really make a shift in your, in your life, right? So, so tell us about how did you choose to be uh, an operator? Because you bought this 42 units recently. And, and I remember talking to you like one year ago when I met you in California or maybe six months ago, right? I, we did a meetup there in uh, Long Beach. You know, you were like, okay, I want to get, get into the game. I, I, got, I know multifamily is really good. And you started your own meetup and you, everybody's excited, right? So, and you said, okay, I want to get started with, uh, you know, capital raising. And, uh, and we had that discussion, right, about some being operator and what's your background. And, and, and tell me about your background and how did you choose to become an operator? Yeah. So my background is being an operator and that's why I'm an operator now, but my background was in the golf business and I was a general manager and a regional manager for a golf management company uh, for about 15 years. So what I did was manage people, manage the business, manage the P and L's, you know, drive revenues, control expenses, hire, uh, fire, manage people. And so, you know, my whole entire background is really in, in operations and logistics um, and business. And so at the time when we were talking, I was really struggling because I knew when I first started our company that I wanted to be an operator. However, it's a hot market. It's very tough to find deals. And I was, you know, kind of like that Facebook frenzy, fear of missing out. You, you want to get in the game. And so I was struggling because I was presented with some deals to raise capital on. And, and I knew these people and they were good operators. And it was a really good opportunity for me to jump aboard. Um, I decided not to jump on board, not because I didn't believe in the operator or the deal, but really because I wanted to stick to my values and who I believe I am. And then also my strengths and my strengths are really as an operator. And so we passed on those and just kind of kept grinding and knew we would eventually get to the point where we did get a, a property and we can operate on our own. And that's kind of where we are today. So were you able to see someone else who's an operator and you can align with it? Or how did you know that being an operator is what you want to do? It's because of my background, it's just, it's just something that I am, am naturally kind of transferring over from the golf business to here. I think a lot of people hear, okay, you're in the golf business. That's completely different than real estate. And that may be the case, but we're doing the same things in the golf business that we're doing, you know, in real estate. We are driving our revenues. We're controlling our expenses. We're making sure that our employees or our third-party property management company are doing the job that they need to do to operate the property. Um, so it was an easy transition really for me. And it's just something I've been doing for so long that I, I really enjoy it. it it's, um, you know, I'm not a big sales guy. I'm not, um, I mean, we do find our own deals and, and do all that kind of stuff too. Um, but as far as raising capital, it, it wasn't something that, I was really in love with doing and, and really with an operator, it's the stuff that I love doing, you know, diving into the P&Ls, seeing um, it, working out the business plan, uh, working together with a third party property management company to make sure that we are um, doing the right things to get to the numbers so our investors make their returns. Yeah, there's so much capital nowadays looking for a place to, uh, you know, park their money and make money, right? So sometimes it's easier to start with being a capital raiser or being a partner who's being a, who's, uh, who's, you know, bringing a chunk of uh, the capital, right? But, but uh, for me, it's always the operator at the top of the food chain, right? They make the most money, they control the whole deal, they are the backbone of the business. And this, this person who's the operator, it's so important because they know the detail of the business plan, right? They know how they, how did they come up with the pro forma of rent increase? How did they underwrite the deal? How, which uh, comps did they go and shop, right? And when some things are doesn't go right, the operator have to bring back the, the plane to the flight path again, right? And they are the one who can control all that. Whereas if you're in any other role, it's very hard for you to do that. And, and I think it's important that the... Capital raisers, uh, I mean, not capital raisers, the investors need to know who are the operators because, you know, uh, the operators are the backbone of the deal. So I think that's a very key uh, uh, fact. So coming back to the deal that you do, uh, how did you choose to do 42 units and not 10 units or 100 units? 
Yeah. So I think in a perfect world, we would have probably started with something a little bit larger, but I think you also have to know your limits as an operator and, and as, and as a money raiser. And so, you know, let's just say we were going to go after a $10 million deal. That's 120 units. We would have to, you can back into the number that you're going to need to be able to, to close on. Right. So you need $3 million for the down payment, another, let's just say million for the, the cap or for the CapEx. So you're 4 million. So does your net worth and liquidity get to what you need to close on the loan? Can you raise four million? And so all those things we had tracked, and we felt that uh, this forty-two unit at the price point that it was, that we could raise enough money. We had the net worth and liquidity to to, to take it down, and we it's a good sized property to to have be our first deal. So how did you align your team to be ready to take on that 42 units? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how did you come up with that $3 million limit, right? So you must have either your net worth or, you know, someone who acted as a key principal, as a KP. Yeah, so this is an interesting story, actually. Originally, we were going with a Freddie Mac loan. And uh, the team was my fiance and I, who's my business partner. And then our parents were going to sign on the loan as KPs to bring on the net worth piece and liquidity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and halfway through we were, I wouldn't say we were struggling with the capital raise, but we were not feeling as comfortable as we should have. We, we had to raise about a million dollars on this deal and about three weeks in, we were about halfway there. And so the plan was to bring in another partner to help with asset management and raise capital if we were not able to, to get there and use our extension. Well, at that point, uh, our mortgage broker said, hey, Kyle, it's too late to bring on a GP. We've already submitted your, your loan application to Freddie Mac. Uh, we're not adding any more GPs. So then I, we were stuck between a rock and a hard place, to be honest, because it was either continue to raise, but we're doing a 506B, right? So it's not like we can meet new people. We, our network is our network at that time. And so we would really have to grind it out and convince some of the people that weren't on board to, to come on board or come up with our own capital uh, or switch over and, and try to find another um, another lender. And the reason why we were in that position is it, I fully believe that you need to raise 100% of your capital or else you just can't execute on your business plan. If, if your business plan is to raise a million dollars and you only raise $700,000, you are $300,000 short on executing on your business plan. And that's very crucial. And we are not the type of uh, investors that utilize the cash flow from our properties to put back into the, into the CapEx. We feel like that could really hurt you if the revenues go down or for some reason you have a big expense, you don't have cash flow that month. Now all of a sudden you can't put money back into the property and your business plan suffers. So we always raise the capital up front for the capital improvements so that we can execute them whether our incomes are up or down. So we decided to switch 29 days left to close after our extension. We switched from Freddie to Fannie um, and a new lender. And it was a pretty stressful time. But so we brought on a KP to sign on it. And that KP we had known for about 10 months. We've been building a relationship with them um, and wanted to do other deals. We looked at several other deals together. And uh, we met through our meetup. And um, there was one other partner that came on board that helps with asset management and raised. Um, it was about we were we raised about nine hundred thousand ourselves, and this other person came in um, and raised a hundred thousand to close. And we we literally recorded about an hour before we were supposed to close. Got it. Got it. That's very interesting. So coming to how did you align passive investors before your first deal? Yeah. So we had been building our investor list for over a year before we got this deal. And so it was something that we had planned all along. And the reason why we really hadn't done a deal up until that point, we wanted to make sure that we felt comfortable with the amount of money that we could raise. So we did several things. We obviously went to networking events. We started our own meetup. Um, and we also told all of our friends and family what we were doing. And, you know, through that, through our monthly newsletter, uh, we had an email drip campaign set up where it's 20 months of emails, just educating them on who we are, what we do, uh, why we do it. And, you know, it's really about adding value to other people and educating them about what you do and making them comfortable with, with what you do. So, uh, after about a year, we built up that list and, um, you know, it's several hundred people up at, at this point and we felt comfortable to where we could raise the money. 
So which channel was the most effective? I think you did some kind of drip campaign through your emails and you did a, a meetup and you also tell everybody and is there anything that I missed out? And can you explain which one was the most effective in getting the passive investors on your first deal? Because you are new, right? I mean, you're completely yep. new. Yeah, I would say it was 50-50 between friends and family who have known us for a while and then the meetup. I, I would definitely say the meetup group was the strongest one um, because at the meetup on a monthly basis, we had been doing it for 12 months at that time. You're seeing people face-to-face -face for 12 months, you know, and you're becoming friends with these people and very close with them and getting to know them on a personal level um, and really building that strong relationship with them. So I think that was um, the strongest for sure. We do have a podcast as well, but that didn't start until March of this year. So that was not something where, um, wh where it was kind of on board quite yet. Okay. Okay. And how did you, so today, let's say you found the deal, you underwrote it, it works well. So how did you communicate that to your, to the people in your list? And, and yeah, so, how, how did you convince them to invest with you? Yeah. So it, it started with an email, but it also took a ton of phone calls. I mean, I, I think it's all in the follow-up when you're raising money, right? And uh, you can't just call someone after seeing them six months later and say, Hey, I've got a deal. Do you want to put in 50,000 on this deal? It's, it's really about building that relationship. So, you know, every month I try and reach out to our investors and just whether it's through email or text or phone call, I try and touch them in some way on top of our monthly communication with them through our uh, drip campaign and database emails. Um, but it was really about talking to them, meeting them in person for coffee one by one and telling them about the opportunity that we had. So apart from the 50% of investors, which came from your friends and family, I mean, they are friends and family and they don't mind giving you some money, right? So the people who are completely strangers and you have built up that relationship, right? So uh, what do you think is the biggest factor that they trust you with their money? The value that we've added to them. You know, it, it wasn't just... Um, if they wanted to hop on a phone call with me and just ask me for advice on where they're going with their real estate career, we would do free calls. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think also just, you know, the meetup, the podcast, the monthly emails, it's just everything that we provide for them. We also have um, an online, uh, free online passive investors guide that they can read that's about 30, 40 pages that, that helped educate them. And then I think the other thing was, is they just saw the passion in us. I mean, Lolita, who's my uh, wife now, um, fiance back then, we would drive to Tucson at two in the morning because we both had full-time jobs at that time and uh, I've since left, but she still had one. She only gets one day off a week. So on her day off, we would leave at two in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, get to Tucson around nine or 10 a.m., tour properties, meet with investors, brokers for about eight hours, and then drive back and get back the next day at like 1 or 2 a.m. So just telling the story about what we're doing and how hard we're working, I think people saw it in us that, that this was something we were very serious about. We didn't take lightly. And we operate our company like a company, like a business. You know, This is a serious business and uh, we're an investment firm and, and we take it seriously. Um, we, we don't do this part-time and we don't do this kind of on the side, which you can certainly do. And I know several successful investors who do that, um, but they also take it very seriously like a business. And um, I, I think that's a very important thing. Was there any big aha moment that you see uh, throughout that process? Because it's your first deal. Yeah, uh, I think we would have just lined up our partners beforehand instead of trying to do it all on our own. We could have gotten it done on our own, but it was just a very stressful thing. And it could have really put our investors' money at risk, right? Which is something that you just don't want to do. So I think lining up your team up front. But I think from like an operation standpoint, I think where my experience helped is that in, during the close, you still need to make sure the property is operating on a positive note, if it starts to go backwards, your proceeds from the lender is going to get cut. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of other things, your returns are not going to look as good. So you need to stay on the property management company that's currently managing it, whether you're going to switch over or not, you're going to have to manage the broker to make sure they're doing everything they can to make sure that pe they're renting up, they're, they're pushing it, they're still putting renovations in there, and they're managing it at the level that you want it to be managed when you take over. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what I was, uh, you know, want to make sure that uh, everybody does that, right? Uh, and uh, what about uh, any issues in the money raise other than uh, like, was there any surprises at the end? 
No, actually there wasn't. I mean, we, we raised all the funds prior to close, which was fantastic. Uh, I, I would say that raising money, you really get a peek behind the curtains of people's lives. Um, it, you know, people are, whether they're closing on a house and need to show liquidity and can't invest, or they're out of town for a while, or they're having a baby, so they can't invest. So all I would say is that if you plan on raising a million dollars, you should probably have $2 million of commitments because just because someone says, yes, I'll invest doesn't mean they will. And something can be going on in their life where, yeah, they want to, they want to commit and invest, but it's just not the right timing. So raising money comes with, uh, it's a huge timing thing. You know, you're, you're raising money for 30 to 45 days. And so it's, it's not a big window and there's things going on in other people's lives that may, you know, stop them from being able to commit to that one, one deal. Got it. Got it. So Kyle, I mean, you are a new person, bought your first deal. How did you, what was your strategy to find that first deal? How did you network with brokers off market or what did you do? Yeah, it was really networking and leveraging the brokers as much as I can, but it was driving out to the markets. And it's something that we still do to this day. We're in the market every single week because we believe in those strong relationships and meeting people face to face and showing them that we're serious. I think a lot of -of out-of-state investors call brokers on a regular basis, but hardly ever see them face to face. And I found it very beneficial to have lunches and dinners and coffees and and touring the properties with the brokers and having face to face because you get to learn who they are. And and, you know, even outside of the business aspect, you get to know them as as a person and individual. So that's been really beneficial to us. So the way we found the 42 unit, we were in town in Tucson, and one of the brokers called me and said, Hey, Kyle, we just got the keys to this property. Would you like to walk it with us? I haven't seen in any of the units. And so we walked it. And so we were the first ones to see it. And it was three weeks before it was on market. And by the time they brought it to market, we had done all of our due diligence. We had a head start on everyone and we were able to take it down. Yeah, it's interesting that, uh, I mean, usually brokers, uh, especially on a much larger deal, they are very, very skeptical or they do not want to deal with a lot of new people right because there's a lot of people looking at the much larger deal and you went to 40 something units which is a lot of big guys don't look at it right which is i think is an absolute good strategy for a person to start i I'm not, i know a lot of people out there telling just go and buy above 100 units because there's so much capital you can syndicate but it's also harder to get started because there's a lot of people looking at above 100 units right so Starting, I started with the 45 units and I really learned a lot, right? So do you think you are learning a lot and how many months already right now? It's been two months uh, since we've closed. And yeah, absolutely. I am learning a lot on the whole process from A to Z, right? Now we're in my comfort zone where I'm operating the property, managing the property manager. So um, I'm still learning uh, on how the property management company kind of does things, but I, I really do feel like I'm in my comfort zone right now. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, you really learn a lot when you buy, you know, deals on your own and even you buy smaller uh, properties because you are, you're going to be learning everything. But the thing is the knowledge that like I got from 45 units and the knowledge that you are getting in the your 42 units is going to take you, you know, to above thousand units pretty easily, right? Uh, because you are doing it yourself, right? So sometimes when you buy your too big of a deal, there's too many GPs in, in the GP shape and you give it to third party, you're not there, you're not being an active asset manager, you may you may skip a lot of knowledge, right? So, so um, do you have a property manager right now for forty two units, or how is that being worked out? We do, and I think we got lucky on this. Um, we have a property management company that is the biggest property management company in Phoenix, and they also have a lot of properties in Tucson. It just so happens that most of their owners have sold their properties in Tucson, so now they're trying to build back their portfolio. So I caught them on a really good time. They know I want to scale in those two markets. Um, And so they typically do not manage properties under 100 units. And we we were able to convince them to manage this property. So we don't have full-time staff, but we have a part-time leasing agent and a part-time maintenance person. But we're able to piggyback off of another property so that they're both uh, full-time employees. And so that's worked out really good. And having a third-party property management company that's as large as they are, we're able to leverage... Uh, they have an in-house GC team. We can leverage all their relationships. They have an in-house marketing team. So there's not a lot of 42 units that have uh, you know their own Facebook page, their own website, and and all that kind of stuff. And 
And this third party property management company does that for us. Awesome. That's, that's very interesting because I know 42 units is going to be hard to have a, I think you probably can have like one person, but I think you're managing it with the leasing agent and a, and a part-time maintenance, right? So that's yeah. awesome. And they are sharing it with other properties, which is really good. Really good. And so why did you choose Tucson? You know, first we were looking into Phoenix and Phoenix is a really hot market right now. And we love everything about it. It's just very competitive. So a lot of the brokers that we were talking to said, Kyle, what you're looking for value add B2C class assets, take a look at Tucson. And at that point, this was a year and a half ago or just over a year ago, we weren't really sold on it because we didn't know much about it. So what we did is we started going out there every week and started learning the market you know, the rent growth, population growth, all those metrics are very good in Tucson and they, they follow the Phoenix market. So the more time we spent out there, the more we started to like it. Now I would say about Tucson is you have to be careful where you buy. It's definitely a pocketed area, but it's got job diversity just like Phoenix does. And that's why we like both of those markets. The proximity of them is another good point for us. I'm out in the markets every week. And so I could either drive or fly but be there pretty quickly. Whereas if I was investing in Florida, it would be difficult for me to make it out there on a weekly basis um, and de- dealing with the time changes and things like that. Got it, got it. And what was the value add that you see in this deal? Well, there's a lot of value adds on it. The, the previous owner was a very hands-off owner. And the first time we saw the property, um, it was pretty evident, you know, there's just not a lot of money being put back into the property. The sign on the front on the corner had a phone number that was disconnected. They did not have any online presence. So I'm actually not even sure how they were leasing up the units. Um, so that was an opportunity right there. And okay. we've already been able to get the performer rents prior to any renovation starting, um, just by having a phone number that works, having someone that responds, Um, you know, the property management company that they had in there was a single family home provider. So, you know, any type of service call, they're getting charged $35, $40 an hour, even if it's to open a door for someone. And so there's a lot of repair and maintenance money in there that, that is being wasted. Um, but overall it's just being mismanaged from an income standpoint and an expense standpoint. Got it. Got it. Got it. So, I mean, I want to go back to, you know, for people who are newbies who want to get started in this business, right? Is there any advice that you want to give it to any newbies that you want to emphasize right now? Yeah, I've said this a a lot lately and it's just get out of your comfort zone. Um, It's something that is, it's very difficult at times, but once you start doing it, you really, you really start to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And, and that's been the biggest thing for us. You know, I would say 15 months ago, I would not be able to speak on this podcast. I could not speak in front of a group of people at a meetup. I was just terrified and, uh, I just decided to jump right in. So we've got two meetups now. Uh, I've got a podcast and I put my job to pursue this full time. We've just closed on our first property. And you know, I, now I'm on other people's podcasts. So I would just say, get out of your comfort zone. I try and do something three or four times a year now that gets me out of my comfort zone. Because as you get out of your comfort zone, you grow as a person, you grow as a business owner, and you will elevate your game that much faster. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So why do you want to do this for your, you know, for your rest of your life? Why? It's building generational wealth. Uh, Multifamily is not get rich quick by any means, but it's definitely get rich over a long period of time. And and you can build generational wealth, which is what I'm focused on and really want to provide my family with, with that opportunity. But at the same time, we're helping other people build generational wealth. And that's what I love the most. We can add value into other people's lives and we can help create passive income for other people who, you know, a lot of people who we talk to don't, know about multifamily or passive investing. They only know the stock market. And so we really want to help educate people and say, hey, look, there's a there's another way, there's a better way. Um, and there's a better way to diversify your portfolio as well. So we love helping p- other people build generational wealth while we do the same thing. Awesome. Awesome. Is there anything that, I mean, I think I know you have been on a few other podcasts. Is there anything that you think that you have not shared in any of the podcasts that you want to share to our business? Hmm. 
You know, I just think that you, yeah, actually aligning your interests with your business partner. So my business partner is my fiance, right? And I think that a lot of people ask us, how do you work with your significant other? And I don't think it's for everybody, but the one thing that has worked really well for us is making sure that we wrote down our goals and our aligned our interests before we started anything to make sure that we're on the same page. So even up through ups and downs, we always remember and look back to that and say, okay, these are our goals. So even if it's not your fiance or significant other, if it's your business partner, you've got to make sure that your goals are aligned before, you know, otherwise, once you're doing deals, it's it's just too late to start having those kind of conversations. So definitely have the conversations up front. And, and, and while you're building your team, make sure that you take the time to get on the same page, because it, a lot of people just want to get going now, right? And if you want to get going now and you get the wrong business partner, it's going to come crumbling down in the future. And so take more time up front to set up your teams and, and align yourself with the right people so that you can, you can streamline your business and really be off and going on the right foot. Awesome. Awesome. Where and how our listeners can find you? Yeah, sure. We've got our podcast that you mentioned, which is Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate. Uh, our website is www.limitless-estates.com. And you can shoot me an email at kmitchell at limitless-estates.com. Awesome, Kyle. So thanks for coming over to this podcast. And for the audience, just to announce our launch of our own mentoring program, uh, it's called Multifamily A to Z Mentoring mentoring program learn how to be an operator i think they're just not I, I'm, I'm not sure is there any program out there on teachers you know any newbies or anybody who want to get started in this business on how to be an operator right so and we want to cover a to z because we do a to z so property management asset management raising money and how to build a business by itself so so we have launched that if you are interested let me know send me a mail uh, james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com I think we are done. Thank you very much, Kyle, for coming on board. And you had tons of value to our listeners. Thank you. Thanks, James. I had a blast. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audio book. It's the audio version of his best-selling book on passive investing. You can get the audio book completely free, along with other valuable resources by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.